right. Test one, two, test, test, test. How's everyone doing? Good? Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so what I wanted to do today was talk through uh, container standards and interfaces. Uh, this is not going to be a talk full of dynamic demos. I'm sorry. Um, but it is a really important topic that I think um, ties the industry together and actually gets us to a point where um, we have confidence in building uh, infrastructure around this new technology and the industry has confidence uh, that we're not a bunch of crazies sitting in a room somewhere in San Francisco, right? Um, so if you're not familiar with CoreOS, CoreOS is a uh, collection of open source projects. Um, we have CoreOS Linux. Um, we contribute to projects such as uh, Kubernetes and Docker. We also have a number of projects like etcd and Rocket. Um, we are also a, a, a commercial company, um, and we build a number of products uh, such as Quay, which hosts and builds containers, um, and then also a, an enterprise platform for all this container stuff called Tectonic, um, which is built on Kubernetes, includes Quay and CoreOS Linux and a bunch of other components that you need to actually uh, maintain and run containers. So uh, what I wanted to do today is talk about the work that um, uh, we've been doing along with a bunch of the industry, um, Google and Red Hat and Docker and a, a bunch of other folks. Um, I think I've saw a couple of folks that are involved in this whole mess. There, there he is right there in the back, Vincent Batts, um, has been along with us on this journey along with a bunch of other people. Um, and so <clears throat> let's just go ahead and talk through some of the requirements that we have. Uh, we're going to go ahead and set our uh, our text editor is to 72. Everyone ready for this? And we're just going to drill through it. No, that's, that's terrible. So what we're going to do is tell a story. And we're going to tell a story about containers and why they're important um, and how they work really quick, because I think a lot of people think that they're magical and they're not. So it starts with you as a software engineer. You have some code. You take that code. You put in a container image after compilation. Really, a container image is a bunch of files. Uh, that includes the runtime and then your actual application code. Um, might be Python, might be Java, it doesn't really matter. But it all sits inside of this one container image. Um, you hopefully give that container image a name of some sort, uh, probably a name that you'll be able to later download it from somewhere. Um, ideally, we cryptographically hash that thing so that um, at some point we can take an engineer, say Alice, who we trust to build and develop code inside of our ecosystem to sign that thing, and then we can distribute Alice's public key and ensure that Alice um, is actually somebody who can run code on our servers before we run the code. All right, it makes sense. Everyone up to date on the story? I hope so. You're at container camp. <laughs> uh, so the next bit is actually how this change changes our operations side. So our hope is, is that once things are packaged inside of these containers, we have a collection of machines. Um, we want to tell those machines, hey, run this container. The containers land on the machine. And if we're successful, uh, it doesn't matter what actually is running those containers because there's a specification of how those things work. Um, and we are abstracted away from actually the person who built the container, which is probably some CI CD system like Jenkins or Travis or some batch scripts that the intern put together when we started the project or whatever it is. Um, packages up the container, and then we land it on our infrastructure and our operations engineers we trust to make good decisions, and those operations engineers are patching and maintaining the container runtime and the Linux kernel, et cetera, and uh, take that standard image format and consume it. Everyone on board? Yes? Great. Um, and then we get some bonus things, like we want to have the standards so that things can consume those that aren't build or run, so like I want to be able to crack these containers open and find out if there's vulnerabilities inside, et cetera. All right, so we've been on this long journey. Um, this journey uh, we're going to walk through and try to string together all the pieces uh, in the journey. Um, and the journey is going to end here uh, at last week um, with some really important stuff that's happened inside of this thing called the Open Container Initiative. So uh, we're all familiar with Docker. Um, Docker is a collection of a number of things. Um, it's an image format, it's a container runtime, it's a log collection daemon, it's an init process. Um, well, until this most recent release, uh, it includes an init process. Um, it's a container image build system. It's a lot of stuff. Um, but really what we're going to be talking about here today is just the image format. And so 17 months ago, we started with this Docker image format. Um, and this is circa uh, 2014. It's very fluid. 
Um, and fluidity is not something that you would necessarily want uh, going forward long term inside of a format. Um, and the fluidity was natural because the project was young. Um, it wasn't content addressable, which is a bit of a problem. Um, if Alice wants to sign the image, you can't because uh, there's nothing to sign because it doesn't have a, a hash that's, um, that's well known for that image. Um, there's no name and delegation, so I can't do things like say, I own example.com and I want example.com to host all of its objects for these containers at this S3 bucket or on Google's container registry or whatever. Um, and so you didn't really have this concept like MX records. And there's no mechanism for signing. Um, so Alice is kind of uh, unable to do her work and nobody can actually trust the images that are landing on the machine. So that's circa 2014. Um, 16 months ago, December 2014, um, we, along with some other folks, introduced a container image standard called the Application Container. Um, it exists at github.com slash appc. Um, and it includes a bunch of stuff. Uh, app container image format. Um, so what exactly does the application consist of? That tarball and all those files. Um, image discovery, which is how do I actually find and download this thing and delegate it. So it's similar to my MX records where I can say, I own example.com, but I trust Gmail to actually host and, uh, and own that, the email um, services. Um, it was content addressable, uh, so you can actually get a cryptographic ID and have somebody sign it. Um, and at the same time, uh, slightly confusingly, we also announced a container engine that we built called Rocket, um, which was an implementation of this app container standard. <clears throat> and so uh, what happened um, was that over the uh, life cycle, over the last 16 months, is that uh, a lot of interesting build systems have popped out uh, that are compliant with this standard. So things like a bunch of shell scripts popped out. We use shell scripts to build containers for like etcd because it's a statically um, compiled Go binary. Uh, things that convert from Docker to app container images. Uh, things like DGR, which this uh, company in Europe that is similar to Zipcar called Blablacar, which uh, sounds way cooler in French when somebody with a French access to, accent says it, Blablacar. But when you say it with an English accent, it sounds like you're stuttering. Um, and so uh, they, they've been building interesting build systems called DGR against this. And so there's been kind of this uh, explosion of build systems that are purpose-built for people's use cases. <clears throat> and that was the goal, right? Our goal was to write down the specification in the hopes that people uh, who have particular use cases for how the containers come together, or they want to integrate with existing build systems that they've invested time and effort in their QA engineers and understand um, can use those systems. So uh, 12 months ago, <clears throat> um, a bunch of folks inside the Docker community, um, Vincent in the back there again, um, and lots of folks within the uh, Docker community as a whole, um, worked on a new image format um, called the Docker v2.2 format. And this uh, fixed a bunch of things. One is that um, it was content addressable, much stricter about versioning, uh, so there's less fluidity, which is, is great. It makes it much easier to implement registries and such. Um, it didn't uh, tackle the, the concern that we had around name delegation. Um, and it had optional but uh, non-prescribed signing, which is, which is fantastic. We have this content addressability property. So 10 months ago, uh, December, we, uh, we formed this Open Containers Initiative thing. Um, that date is wrong. But we formed this Open Containers, that's not, I'm glad that we have observant people in the room. It's perfect. Um, we, we formed this Open Containers Initiative thing. Uh, lots of folks involved. Um, you can kind of see the, the headline there with Amazon and Google and Docker and CoreOS and uh, lots of folks. And the hope here is that we are able to come together as a big white community and standardize a lot of the stuff inside of these containers. Um, and what we started with was we started with the OCI runtime spec. Um, so the runtime spec is not meant for consumption really by these build systems or uh, people who are deploying the code. It's really meant for consumption for people who are implementing the, the actual container runtimes. So uh, these are people like ourselves who are building Rocket. These are people uh, like uh, the Docker, uh, Docker who's building Docker. Um, and so it talks about like verbs and how C groups are set up et cetera, et cetera. So this isn't really something that a lot of us should concern ourselves with. And if we are concerning ourselves with, it's probably because some piece of the software stack's broken and we're having to dig through a bunch of code, okay? So it does things like define start and stop verbs and then file system layouts for a runnable asset. Um, things that generally we're not super concerned with as, as end users. And so uh, the OCI spec as of 
V04. We just did V05, I think, a few weeks ago or a week ago. Um, essentially, th this is where it's at. And so last week, um, we formed a new project inside the OCI uh, called the OCI Image Format Spec. And this is really exciting because it means that all these folks who have implemented registries, Amazon has a public registry they run, Google has a public registry they run, CoreOS has a public registry, Quay that we run, Docker has the Docker Hub. Um, all these folks are in the same room talking about how do we actually write down a spec that can be shared and hopefully interoperate between all these different systems. Um, we're starting with uh, essentially a pretty good uh, starting point um, and we have the, the major things addressed that we want to have addressed, which is a serialized image format in scope and a content addressable uh, 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 manifest. Hmm. All right. Um, I think the, uh, the sound room has also turned on their microphones. So uh, some optional stuff inside of this spec includes signatures, which are important again, and naming and federation so we can do these MX record style things. So where are we going with this? Um, the goal is to get this standard container. Um, we currently kind of have the runtime stuff underway, but it's not finished, it's not 1.0 yet. Uh, we want to have this image format as well. The image format, I would argue, is uh, even more urgent and important than the runtime itself. <clears throat> we want to end up in a spot where we have good, strong identity and signing around that and discovery and naming. And distribution is something that I think is important, but not necessarily something that we're tacking at, uh, tackling at the moment. And the goal overall is to enable innovation, both in build systems so that people can build things the way they'd like, and that they can use runtimes that consume those images uh, that they prefer. All right. So, any questions on that before we move on to the next topic? We good? All right. So, container networking is another bit. Um, there are a lot of moving parts inside of these containers, and one that um, the, the image, I think, is the most important, and that's why I covered it first. But the other bit is actual uh, storage and connectivity of these containers. Um, at the end of the day, the container is not super exciting unless it's able to talk to other things. So um, there are two things that I'll cover here. The first is a thing called the Container Networking Interface, which was initially designed for Rocket, um, and it's used in a bunch of other projects today. Um, and you can find that project at github.com slash appc slash cni. And then I'll also talk about the Lib Network uh, project that's part of uh, Docker. So what CNI does is it tackles this problem of uh, how do I create connectivity between two containers? And it starts with the, uh, the way that Kubernetes does its networking. Um, if you're not familiar with that, essentially it gives every single container a, its own IP. Um, and so the concept, if you haven't used Kubernetes, is a pod. So you may have lots of containers sharing this single IP, um, working together in some way, but the idea is that we set up essentially L3 connectivity uh, for a, a collection of processes. Um, and the hope there is that by using an IP, we can interact with normal stuff like DNS and regular uh, L7 load balancers and that sort of stuff. All right, so what, what CNI does is it is an actual standard that defines how these networks are set up and then includes uh, and works with a number of different projects. So we're able to set up things using normal Linux bridges, Mac VLAN, IP VLAN, Open vSwitch, um, Weave, which is a company, I don't know if anyone from Weave is here, but a company that does networking uh, for containers, a project Calico uh, also does networking for containers, um, Flannel, and then we interact with the cloud providers as well. So we provide this single interface that allows you to um, interact and connect L3 addresses with lots of different things. That's what CNI is built to do. Um, and so there's a number of questions that you have to figure out in order to implement this, uh, or actually in order to do this sort of connectivity. So you need to figure out how am I actually going to be allocating the uh, IP addresses for these containers, whether it's coming from things on the host, local information like this host has this entire subnet, maybe it's coming from DHCP, maybe it's coming from some IPAM system that you have set up internally, uh, it's backed by a database or something, uh, or it's, it's set up by your actual SDN thing like Weave or Calico or whatever. And so you can think of logically uh, as CNI as this adapter between uh, the container runtime, uh, maybe it's Kubernetes, maybe it's Rocket, maybe it's whatever, and then uh, the actual technologies that are used inside the Linux kernel to set up uh, networking and routing uh, for these L3 addresses. <clears throat> 
Um, and so CNI works pretty simply. It allows you to plug in lots of different um, networks into a single container. Um, and there's two verbs in order to do that. You can either add a container to a network or remove a container from the network. And it's all kind of prescribed via a JSON um, object. So it's something like this. You set up you know, your IP allocation method and then the actual method the Linux kernel is going to use to set up the addresses. Um, you create a new network namespace. Uh, this is how you do that on the command line if you've never seen that before. Uh, it's actually kind of fun. I'd recommend everyone go to LWN and read the uh, like eight part series on how namespaces work inside of the Linux kernel. Um, you can do it, all this stuff in Bash. Um, there's actually CNI plugins that are implemented in Bash. But, uh, so you can, um, you essentially set up a network namespace and then you export the, uh, the interfaces through environment variables and standard in and standard out, very Unix-y sort of plugin model. And so you set up the environment variables necessary saying I'm gonna be adding this thing to a network, the container ID is this, et cetera, et cetera and then you execute the actual, um, the actual plugin with its JSON configuration uh, piped into standard, uh, standard in. And so uh, because this all runs as a process, it allows for a, a lot of flexibility. Plugins are able to manage their own state. They just get uh, executed every time a new container comes up or a container is destroyed. Um, and this is really essential because a lot of network providers have really complex control planes. Um, and if you're buying from a network provider, this is how they make a lot of money. Um, so uh, it's important to them that they continue to have these um, complex control planes that actually do add value, allowing you to set rules and consumption rules and operations rules and firewall rules, et cetera. Um, it exposes the entire full Linux stack because all we do is execute a process inside the network namespace. And so you're allowed to do whatever you usually do inside the Linux stack, whether that's set setting up routes or setting up um, setting up IP tables, et cetera. And um, it's, it completely gets out of the way. Uh, CNI says implement the interface. If you're able to deal with standard in and standard out and some environment variables, then go for it. And that's where the spec ends. Um, so CNI has a pretty uh, large community at this point. We have maintainers from CoreOS, uh, Pivotal, and Weaveworks um, in the maintainers group. Um, it's used inside of Rocket, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, Kerma, which is a runtime from AppSera. Um, and it's usable with Run C. Uh, I think the Weaveworks folks did a prototype with Run C. Um, and there's a bunch of external plugins that exist. Notable ones are um, Metaswitch Networks, um, Project Calico, and Weaveworks. And then there's also discussions about this project going into the CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, <laughs> which is. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I'm happy to explain that offline. Um, it's quite confusing with all these acronyms. All right. So the other sort of networking model that has emerged in the container ecosystem is the container networking model. Um, <clears throat> CNM is implemented, uh, well, sorry about the weird formatting, but it's implemented by LibNetwork, um, which is a, a Docker subproject. And um, CNM kind of defines a, a logical network model um, that's a little, <clears throat> that, uh, that uses some new vocabulary. So the network is like a logical network. You can think VLAN. Um, there's an endpoint uh, that you connect a sandbox into a network. And then a sandbox is the actual container level networking. Um, so like the, the actual container namespace sort of. Um, <coughs> So you can think of it something like this. Uh, this is directly taken from the LibNetwork uh, source tree. You have the, uh, the sandbox, and then you kind of plug these, um, these uh, uh, sandboxes into these, these networks. Um, it includes a, a number of uh, plugins today. Um, Bridge, which is the default Docker networking we're all familiar with, Docker Zero, blah, blah. Um, an overlay networking system that um, where the Docker engine actually coordinates through a key value store like etcd um, the setup of an overlay network based on VXLAN, um, which uses UDP and CAP and, uh, and, and actually tunnels traffic um, over, the, over the network, um, L2 frames over UDP. And then um, remote, which is um, what everyone else uses to plug into this thing. Uh, technically, I think bridge and overlay are also remote, but the actual API is called remote. <clears throat> and so remote plugins, um, uh, 
they operate as this long-running uh, API service that then uh, LibNetwork talks to. Uh, the networking features uh, inside of LibNetwork are restricted um, to whatever the API exposes because you're talking over this interface um, over JSON and HTTP. Um, and it's, uh, uh, from what I've heard from other networking vendors is that it's sort of difficult to integrate um, because of this API model um, because you're not actually like directly manipulating the underlying uh, namespaces. Um, and that there's some problems with uh, getting the full metadata of the container um, about uh, what it's actually doing. Um, and so the Lib Network community includes uh, Docker and then Tencent, which is a large uh, company in China. Um, it's used by the Docker engine, and there are a few external plugins available, um, such as Metaswitch Networks and uh, Weaveworks, uh, Metaswitch Networks, Project Calico and Weaveworks. So uh, some conclusions about that discussion. Um, CNM creates a new interface for the networking world. Um, it's kind of hard to integrate into existing solutions. Uh, there's a blog post by uh, Tim, uh, who's sitting back there, talking about um, struggles with integrating um, Lib Network and CNM into uh, Kubernetes. Um, it exposes networking concepts not through the existing Linux interfaces, but through new APIs and a new model, and uh, is adopted by the Docker engine. And then CNI is a simple model. Um, for container networking in that it directly exposes the Linux networking stack to plugins. Um, it works with uh, just simply Unixy processes, um, and it's been adopted inside of projects such as Rocket, Kerma, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, and RunC. Well, it's not adopted by RunC, it's usable with RunC. RunC doesn't actually implement networking, but that's another point. All right, so uh, that's, that's the end of my talk. I'd like to invite you, we're running an event in Berlin and also a a separate event inside in San Francisco. So if you want to sit in a room and talk about containers, um, which I think is a target audience here, um, we have an event uh, May 9th and 10th. And with that, I thank you, and I'd love to take any questions. Thanks. <laughs>